pause when they get to the cliff. And then what they find is, is that if the mother has an expression, a positive expression on her face and is beckoning the child with, in, in a nonverbal way, a positive orientation, the child will continue to come and navigate across that. But if the mother's expression is one of fear, the child will stay or go back. So I think it's fascinating to me that this is just one example of the power of emotional expression and how from the earliest stages of her life, we're in these relationships, uh, particularly in a parent-child relationship of dependence, where we're looking for the emotional signals that tell us whether it's safe or not to navigate um, an issue that we're, where we're trying to explore, for example. A second study, is uh, the still face paradigm by Edtronic. And there's, this has been done for almost 40 years now. There's over 80 studies that have consistently found similar results. In this study, they have a mother and, and an infant, and they put them in a face-to-face -face interaction where the mother engages, play with the child, and then once cued from the investigator, the, child's, the mother's face freezes in response, or she takes a relaxed still face in relationship to the child. The child initially tries to continue to draw the mother back into interaction by doing the same practices that they were doing. They might point or they might coo or they might use, the child uses positive affect to draw the mother back into interaction. But as that fails, then the child becomes more and more upset, becomes angry. Bowlby would describe that as protest behavior to try to draw the mother to review her current action and re-engage in interaction. And eventually the child will disrupt their posture and turn away from the mother in the interaction because they can't sustain trying to be in a caregiving relationship that isn't working. What's fascinating about this interaction is that it begins with attunement, then there's a period of disruption, and then a moment of repair where the mother re-engages play with the, the child, and you see the positive affect quickly return to the child in the interaction itself. Now, one of the things that they've found in the process of these studies is that, in the Bowlby or um, Tronic reported this back in the 1980s, is that uh, parents fail to attune about 70% of the time to their children. In other words, they misattune, they misread the child's cues for response seven out of 10 times which suggests, or at least Tronic's argument is, that misses in interaction are normative. The question in the relationship is whether you know whether you've missed or not and what you do about it. Um, Diana Fascia and, and her approach to using attachment-based therapy with individuals would make the case that rupture and repair um, actually strengthens relationship. So a repaired rupture is stronger than a relationship where there's no, not been a rupture in attunement at all. Because the repair signals the importance of the relationship. All right? Now, that's infants and children. Jim Cohn at the University of Virginia uh, did a series of uh, studies where he put women in relationships. Uh, he, he had the woman in an fMRI tube and it attached an electrode to her heel. And she had, um, so, and she's sitting in this fMRI tube, and she has a video screen in front of her. And when it's a green, uh, the green circle is showing, um, this is the safe condition. When the red X appears, there's a 20% likelihood that she'll receive a painful electric shock in her heel. And so what Cone monitors as this, uh, in the fMRI is, what is happening in the subcortical region of the brain? And is what the electric shock uh, is a threat condition. So what they're looking at is how much of that subcortical region that's associated with you know, the amygdala and fight and flight the limbic system is getting triggered when there's a moment of distress. And then he, he uses that condition and then uh, manipulates it by having the person, the woman in there by herself, and then they do this series of experiments, this, this X and O, X and O, X and O with them by themselves. And then they have a stranger come and hold the woman's hand and then observe what happens in the same sort of condition. And then they have a partner come, that person's partner hold their hand. 
And one of the things that Cohn found consistently was that the activation in the subcortical region of the brain when that individual was by themselves was greater than it was when they were holding the hand of a stranger. Like the, uh, the presence of another person in a time of distress downregulates some of the, the threat that's experienced in that moment. In that, there was a significant difference between holding the hand of a stranger versus holding the hand of someone who's dedicated to you, who's your partner. So when you're holding the hand of your spouse, what Cohn found is that there's less activation in that fight flight area of the brain. And he, what he would suggest is that there's just less perceived threat. It's not that the other person is providing social support and that's counteracting the threat. It's just the world feels safer because I'm connected to another person, right? Fascinating findings, the social baseline theory. And that actually is, shows up in another, the, the same kind of idea shows up in another study by Dennis Prophet, also at the University of Virginia. Prophet studies perception, and he has this, these studies that individuals often overestimate the amount of work it is to climb up a hill. So in San Francisco, for example, the steepest hills are about 13 degrees. People will often, and he uses this, you'll see in the, the woman has her hand on a little device, and that basically what she's doing there is estimating the amount of slope that she sees on the hill. So she can adjust that either up or down to, to give her best judgment of the slope. Well, what Prophet notes is that, you know, in San Francisco, for example, um, the, uh, there's, people will often estimate the hills as being as many as 30 degrees in slope as opposed to 17. So it's, it's an interesting whole exercise in and of itself. And so they'll put backpacks on people. And when they put heavy backpacks on people, people will estimate the amount of, the slope goes up, right? <laughs> right? Because, right? And then that all makes good sense to us because it's more work. So it seems like to me that that would be a much steeper hill given the fact that I've got this weight on my back. But it's interesting. There was a, a couple of studies that they did where they had, um, a person estimating the slope of a hill that they're judging and standing behind, beside them was a person who was dedicated to them. And they consistently found that they estimated the amount of the slope to be less work when you're standing or walking with somebody or standing with somebody who's dedicated to you. Which I think is, is fascinating because it points to, and the message here, is that there is a lot of implicit communication going on that's not verbal, but it's experiential in relationships with people that matter. Our experience, take Cone study, our experience of the world is different when we're with those people that we have a relationship of security with. Take this study, profit study. If I've got somebody dedicated to me, the amount of energy that I have to expend in my life is lessened by virtue of the fact that I've got somebody on my team. Now, it can go the other way, too. Uh, there, uh, there's, there have been these studies on the impact of relationships where the person that you're in a relationship with is using affective suppression. In other words, they're blocking their emotion. They're repressing their emotion. And um, one study in Israel with Mario Michelancer's team found that when they, can, they had partners interacting where they manipulated a condition where one partner took this, this down-regulating their emotions, they were shutting themselves down, and then they hooked up the other partner, and what they found is, is that you, we know that when people suppress their emotions, it shows up in their physiology. Their heart rates can go up, they can experience these negative physiological effects. It's, thought suppression is a good short-term solution. It's not a long-term solution, right? Um, but what's fascinating about this and this idea of secondhand smoke is that when you're in a relationship with a partner who's suppressing their emotion, it literally shows up in the physiology of the other person. They have greater cardiovascular arousal, they experience greater uh, negative affect and less positive affect when their partner is withdrawing, right? So 
I share this as a way to move into a discussion of EFT and the work that we're doing because one of the things that we are working with is the emotions that are occurring in an interaction between two people and the strategies that they use when they're facing threat. Because one of the things they're trying to navigate is this idea of, of interdependence. How do I rely on you? And I don't know how many of you have done a ropes course um, or have done this particular exercise, but I have where you have, to, you have to span this distance, you slide along the ropes, and you do that by leaning on the other person. So as you move, the, the wires narrow, so you need the person less. But you've got to figure out as you're moving how you're balancing yourself against the other person as you're moving. And that is, in my mind, a very good illustration of what couples are doing when they're trying to work out in close relationships the interdependence that they have, where they are, if, if they're moving together, they've got to compromise, right? I can't just do what I want to do. I have to rely on what the other person does, and they have to match me, I have to match them. Uh, there's sacrifice involved, and there's support that's needed in us working together where situations with conflicts, goals, and desires require putting aside our personal interests for the sake of the other person in the relationship. That's this dynamic of interdependence that we see showing up with couples. Now, I'm going to skip ahead to an example uh, of a couple where you can see, and my question to you is, how is their interdependence working, right? Right? They're trying to work out how to be together for each other. And this is um, an example of a distressed couple um, and Sue Johnson working with them to connect to not only their experience in the moment, but what's also behind that. So if you look at these different strategies, a more anxious person tends to be other-oriented and preoccupied with that person, focus on their own and meta attachment needs. They are very self-disclosing. Uh, they'll talk about their own insecure emotions and play them out in the moment. They're less able to be mutually responsive because they're absorbed with what's going on for them in the moment. And they tend to dismiss other people's positive responses. Which of the two do you think fits that strategy? Do you think it was Matt who was looking for a co-pilot? Was he anxious? Or was it Rhea, right, who, who, seemed, who had, throughout had a difficult time staying out of the interaction, right? Wanting to pipe in, wanting to control, wanting to organize what was happening. I think we can see that underneath Rhea's anxiousness in this relationship is a desire for connection, right? The secondary reactive emotions that she experiences, which drive Matt away, are there because what does she have in her heart toward him? A desire to matter, a desire to be connected, a desire to experience closeness with him, reassurance, right? That she's not alone. And then if you cross over to Matt's side, he looks much more like this avoidant tendency or this avoidant strategy where he's more distant oriented, self-reliant, um, tries to put it on the shelf is what he said. I need to box it up and put it away to bottle up his emotions. He's less self-disclosing. He minimizes interdepend interdependence. And he may be less accurate at being able to read what's actually going on. In other words, he experiences her anger, which is perhaps her protest like the still face baby, right? If she feels like he's not responsive and then she responds in anger, he misreads that anger is about him, not about his actions. And I would suggest that even if you explain that to him, it won't change his experience. He'll be able to see it, but he won't be able to feel differently about it. So what do we see with Sue Johnson working with this couple? Because you definitely have the impression of their reactive, interactive pattern that has taken over their relationship. It's poignant when he says, she used to be my co-pilot, but I can't find her anymore. 
That's what I was saying earlier about these distressed states that happen in relationships where all of a sudden they become organized around the negative. I, what I used to be able to do, I can no longer do. So that's the couple that comes in to see the EFT therapist. And what Sue Johnson does is first work with the anxious partner in this particular example, helps Rhea begin to, she follows what she's experiencing in the moment, which are these secondary reactive responses that are cued by her own experience of her talking about how painful it is and difficult it is to try to have a relationship with her husband. And Sue Johnson becomes her secure base, a place of safety for her to be able to share and experience this distress that she has. And as she does that, one of the things that she finds is the emotions that underlie those reactive behaviors. What's underneath her anxiousness is a desire to connect, a desire and need to be reassured. And Sue Johnson finds that not just at an intellectual level, but at an emotional level. And so you, you notice how fast she talks, how interruptive she is. But as, as the interaction slows down, and particularly as Sue Johnson makes the connection with this underlying desire she has and the underlying need and ask her to share that with her husband, she turns and looks at him and she begins to experience the primary emotions of her need for her husband. And as she does that, she slows down. She becomes more organized. Her signals get more clear. Did you see that? But what's difficult about this couple therapy work that we do is that when she turns to him with a more clear signal, what does he do? He, he says, that's too much. You know, nobody's doing that for me. And he reacts in response to that. And that's the nature of their distressing cycle is, is there's new information and that may sound better than what she usually does, but he's not prepared to respond because he's in his isolation and loneliness as well. So what you see the EFT therapist doing is moving across the relationship to the other partner, doing the same thing in a different way, following his avoidance strategies, understanding his experience and where that comes from being there validating, being accessible and responsive to him, helping him begin to explore what, what's underneath for him that, that need for a co-pilot. She focuses on that analogy. A co-pilot is a relationship of dependence, isn't it? Of reliance in a time of need. And she uses that imagery, that experience that he had to connect with his desire for his relationship with her. And, he, and then he gets more clear about that and you see him turning back toward her at the end of this interaction and saying, you know, that, I don't want to lose the bond, right? And that's what's really true for him. Just like she really needs reassurance about her importance with him, he really needs to know that she's not rejecting him, right? And that to me is often the tragedy of distress is that you have two people caught in a struggle to connect, but neither one of them can get to the place of the emotions that they have, the ones that they most need. But the vulnerability of this interdependent relationship gets blocked by the fears that both partners have. It's the still face paradigm playing itself out in the couple's relationship. She looks at him, he's not available. It's the visual cliff exercise. You know, he looks at her and he sees anger and he's not going to cross over the threshold. He's not going to reach for her and try to connect with her because the emotions in the moment send the wrong signals and neither of them can get to a place where they can connect to what's really true about what they want in that relationship. I, st I started off talking about fidelity in, this, in our, our talk and part of that was to want to help you see there is uncertainty in love, right? Brueggemann's point is, is that we might strive for certitude. We might want 100% reliability from the other person, but we don't always get that. And what we do when we don't get that is an expression of love. Oftentimes it's sacrifice. Oftentimes it's self-giving. 
It's extending. It's giving grace. The trouble that we have with, non, with these distressed relationships is that the positive emotions that are characteristic of a relationship of promise all of a sudden begin to work against that relationship. And so the EFT therapist in, in this example is working to you know, join that couple in their destructive dance, this, this clash of titans as they call it, and in the first phase of the model, work to de-escalate the reactive withdrawal and the reactive, anxious, preoccupied stance of either partner and help them begin to see that the problem in the relationship is this pattern that's taken over their relationship rather than the other person. Right? Their experience coming into therapy oftentimes is that this other person is making it impossible for me to have a relationship over time as they begin to understand and experience themselves differently and experience their partner differently, they begin to see that what's actually taking place is this dance of anxiety and withdrawal and avoidance that when they feel fear in their relationship, it organizes everything. It takes over the relationship and leaves them both feeling defeated and distressed in a relationship that really, really matters. Because if it didn't, they wouldn't get into this dynamic at all. They would just simply leave, right? Because the signal of a dying relationship is not conflict. The signal of a dying relationship is indifference. When people don't care, relationships don't matter. And when relationships don't matter, people don't matter. But as long as the people in the relationship matter to each other, then there's hope that that relationship can be transformed. But they need something more than what they have in those moments, right? And so if you go back to Jim Cohn's example, who's holding the hand of this couple, right? Well, you saw Sue Johnson doing a lot of touching in this, right, it's not a whole hand holding, but there was a lot of knee contact in the, in the video. Um, and, and that's something that, that she does, but it's not necessarily something that, you know, it's not an intervention per se, it's a grounding. Um, so I'm not, you know, this isn't, isn't you know, um, holding hand therapy, so. Um, <laughs> but it is, but it is in, in hand holding, it is availability. It is, I am here for you, you can count on me, and when I know, then what's powerful about Cohn's finding is my world feels different to me when I know I can rely on someone to be there when it matters most. And for these distressed couples, the EFT therapist is that attachment base. To walk with them in the midst of their distress, these moments of uncertainty, these moments of fear, and then in the process, because in what we would describe as stage one of this process, with this de-escalation process, the therapist is helping each partner by being available to each partner. And as that happens, first with him, then with her, then with him, with her, back and forth like that, or her and him, going back and forth between the two, both of them start to experience things about the other person that they didn't see before, right? that they, didn't, they lost contact with, that she actually, Rhea, in that interaction, actually gets softer. And she, he can begin to experience that maybe there is a sense in which I'm important to her in ways that I don't often hear. And hope begins to return to that relationship. So one of the things that we're facilitating through this process of working with emotional experience is facilitating hope through the experience of what is already there. You know, I came in, and one of the things that I said to you was, I, I believe that resilience is a necessary part of our work with, with couples and families. And what I'm pointing to in this particular example is the aspects of resilience are those emotions that both partners have, but they cannot use in a relationship of distress. So if I believe that, that I can effectively, right, be that presence 
therapeutically in the relationship that invites each person to, to first recognize the distress they feel, but then be present to that distress in a way, attuned and emotionally regulated, that we can that work together. Remember that diagram of those two figures and what was happening between them, what Alan Shore sometimes described as a right hemisphere to right hemisphere connection. In other words, what I'm doing from an interdependence perspective is I am working with Rhea to help her. I'm, I'm saying, you know, you feel really anxious and really like this is terrible what's happening and I want to understand that with you. Not so we can develop some kind of intellectual understanding about it, but because I can meet you in your distress and your distress can get smaller because I'm standing with you in it, right? Think about um, Prophet's example of the hill, right? When Ray is in that relationship and she looks across the way at Matt and he is in this, he's got this scowl on his face and she's feeling alone, what does her hill look like? Right? But when Sue Johnson steps in and says, yeah, I mean, you see his face and that look on his face, what happens inside of you in that moment? And she, I feel, I feel distressed. I feel panicked. Would that panic make sense to you? Especially if she really relies on him? Of course it makes sense, Sue Johnson would say, and she would validate her experience and she would wonder more about it. So if I can acknowledge her panic, it points me to the importance of that relationship. Does that make sense? Right, oftentimes fighting in couples' relationships is for the purpose of correction. It's not an effective strategy, okay? It doesn't get people where they want to go, but it's what they have when they don't feel safe. Does that make sense? Withdrawal is, a, is also a strategy that couple, but partners use in a relationship of distress. It solves the immediate problem. I don't want things to get worse, he might say. It feels out of control, and the way I know to feel in control is to go into my head and think it through, so I'm not going to say anything. And so what does she look, what does she see when she looks at me? She sees my face like this. Right? Go back to still face. Right? That's even more distressing. But why am I doing this? If I'm this gentleman. I'm actually trying to solve a problem in our relationship. And, and, when, and when I'm sitting here thinking about it, and I'm trying not to react to it because you're so irritating right now, if I'm trying to control this and I'm trying to get clear about myself and I'm trying to go to my happy place so I can find some aspect of myself to be more available to you, and then you just get more angry at me, then what happens? Right? He feels invalidated by her. So the therapist is able to see the withdrawal actually as a strategy of connection. Right? He's working to try to do something different because the relationship matters. And so the therapist steps in as this secure base that enables people to begin to find themselves in their experience and then begin to explore with one another. Right? So this is an interesting slide that I just want to share with you that comes from a study that they did recently completed where they had 30 couples go through a process of EFT. And they did the Jim Cohn hand-holding uh, experiment with the couples before treatment and after treatment. And what they found as a result of you know, taking these distressed couples through this process of treatment is that under the threat condition, um, when holding their partner's hand when their relationship was distressed, you see uh, in the uh, cross section of the brain slide there at the top that that red portion is that subcortical region. This is what they're looking for when they, when they do these experiments is all lit up with activity, right? The distress that I experience with somebody who's supposed to be there for me makes my world more unsafe. But then after the couple learns to and, and 
has these new experiences and finds their connection again, the lower slide is a, a post example of uh, one of these brains under the threat condition holding the secure partner's hand and see how much smaller the activation is in, that, in the brain of that person. Which might suggest that one of the things that we're able to do through the process of therapy is really be able to reconnect couples to increase the resilience that they have in these relationships that they share and love. And then as a result of that, they're more effective at dealing with the threats, the everyday threats that happen in their relationship. So Sue Johnson in, um, developed a program for couples called Hold Me Tight, which leads them through seven different conversations that they can share together uh, about their relationship. And that is a, it's not for couples in distress, it's for couples who are, uh, want to strengthen their relationship. So she calls these Hold Me Tight conversations. And uh, she was recently, uh, actually this month, we'll be publishing uh, this book, uh, Created for Connection, which is written with um, uh, another person uh, who's done a lot of the EFT training, but has done a lot of these Hold Me Tight groups in churches. And so they developed a, a Hold Me Tight manual for uh, Christian couples called Creative, uh, Created for Connection. And the reason I share this with you because, um, you know, if you're interested in exploring uh, the EFT model, there's a variety of different forms of training that is available to sort of really master the process of being able to connect with each partner and then help them connect together. But there are also these kind of resources that help couples be able to strengthen their relationship. And I want to just sort of bring to a cl close this focus on integration by talking a little bit about thinking about attachment relationships and God and what that might mean for couples because that's what you see, that's what one of the premises that she's working with here. So from a systemic perspective, uh, some researchers have suggested that there's, we can think of a divine triangle that occurs in couples' relationships. That a couple relies on each other and they can also rely on God. And that, that idea of sanctification is a good example of that where they see in the context of their relationship, their relationship is being stronger because it's important to God and because both partners rely on God to love in their relationship. So we can also recognize, however, that this kind of triangle can lead to triangulation, where God gets co-opted into the couple's conflict. So you have something that's been referred to as the spiritually one-up spouse, right? Who, um, I, I had a couple come in where the woman's um, presenting complaint was that, I need my husband to be a better spiritual leader. Can you help him? Right? And so as, that was the presenting complaint. I mean, they were having problems in their marriage. Well, I wonder why. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> And, and, and it came out that it was really, you know, so, she, so we learned, I asked her about that, and we, as we were doing some work together, what I learned was that what would it look like for him to be a better spiritual leader? Well, he would lead them more in prayer, and he would initiate prayers in their relationship more often. And we pushed into that even more, and it, we came to find out that, well, she really wasn't interested in him praying more with her. She was really interested in him talking more to her. And it was just that appealing to him being a more of a spiritual leader seemed like a more acceptable route. She felt like she had more leverage if she you know, framed it in a spiritual way. And that's an example of someone sort of taking a spiritually one-up position and they're, using, you know, they're making a relational complaint in their relationship. God really doesn't have anything to do with that, right? Um, also, the other dynamic is, I don't need you, I just need Jesus. Right? You know, Jesus is number one in my life. You'll have to, second place will have to do for you. Um, so take your intimacy needs someplace else. My intimacy needs go to God. Right? Uh, that is uh, the sort of substitute, intimacy substitute. And, you know, I think we can, you can 
find couples where you have a very passionate partner about their spirituality actually interfering with their intimacy in the relationship. They don't share it together. God becomes an excuse for not being intimate with the other person. So our spirituality, our faith can be a resource for connection, but it also can be a source of despair in relationships. God is a, is a stronger, wiser other um, from an attachment perspective. That was Bowlby's language for an attachment figure, somebody that you rely on, who's emotionally accessible, who's open, who is honest, who tells you the truth about who you are and your relationship and is responsive to what matters most. And in you know, the research that's been done on attachment in adulthood, um, has discovered that one of the attachment figures people have and often report is a relationship with God, that God serves that same function. People relate to God as a resource in times of the despairs. And as I said before, the Psalms are full of examples of ways in which the psalmist is turning to God is a strong, as a stronger, wiser other. So, What I want to think with you about is what does it mean for us to have God in mind when we're working with couples in distress? And um, I'd like to share a couple of insights that come from a few research studies that have asked some some similar kinds of questions. But if you think about two people in a relationship, there are two questions that organize their internal working model, if you will. Their model of relationship ask these questions. Do I matter to you? And can I count on you? And each partner has that question. So that, and the interplay of their interdependence is how they answer that question through the days of their lives together. When there's something that comes along, whether it's an issue with a child or whether it's an issue at work or whatever the stressors are, maybe it's an issue of health, there's some threat that comes into the relationship and the question at hand is, Can I count on you to be there for me when I feel afraid, alone, uncertain? And do I matter in your mind? And my partner has the same questions. And when the answers to those questions are yes, we have what John Bowlby described as attachment security, a secure base to go and and address the problems in the world. When the, question, the answer to those questions are no, we have insecurity, and then you have what we saw with Matt and Rhea, this struggle to try to find a resource that they're not even sure is there for them. right? Because when I look at you, I'm not sure I matter to you. And I'm not sure I can count on you. And we, are, we try to work out an answer to that question and prove to ourselves that I can rely, but the way that we do that creates more and more distress. So, I've illustrated to you an example of what happens when we put the therapist into that equation. And the therapist becomes a a resource for emotional regulation of each partner, a resource for attachment security that enables them to begin to experience themselves in new ways. What if instead of a therapist, we put God into that equation, right? Since God is an attachment figure. These are preliminary findings or early findings. There are only a few studies that have uh, tried to look at these kind of questions, looking at marital conflict, the relationship of God to each partner, and attachment distress. Um, uh, But they find some interesting things. So I'd like to review those with you. So uh, thinking about God as the stronger, wiser, rather, as this attachment figure, um, studies have shown uh, positive effects for more... uh, So having God in the relationship, there are positive effects that are more profound for uh, couples that are in um, less effective attachment relationships. So one of the things that we know uh, from this research is that individuals rely on God more when the relationships they're in are feeling insecure. So they're more likely, on the one hand, to turn to God. But we also know that um, couples who have religious beliefs that where God is an attachment figure, also experience greater connection um, in those relationships as a result of that. 
So there's support for a positive relationship between secure romantic relationships and stronger beliefs in God. So individuals feel more connected to each other when they feel connected to God. Right? So we actually have two stories going on. When the relationships are insecure, individual partners more likely to turn to God. When secure relationships, couples that have a sense of security that they're together and God is in the equation, they're, they're more likely to report the security in their relationship and the satisfaction in their relationship is stronger as a result of that. So what that says to me is that God is a resource both for couples in trouble, but also couples who are satisfied and growing, right? And that, that should make sense to us in both ways. But I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into the couples that are having trouble and where might God be in that. Um, and in one study, uh, relig- religiosity was... Uh, found to limit the effects of a husband's neuroticism on marital satisfaction. In other words, you know, in this this particular studies, uh, husbands who had a high religious commitment, even though they might be more anxious or more avoidant, the effects of their avoidance mattered less because their commitment mattered more. In other words, their religiosity as one way of understanding this, is that their commitment to God meant that they showed up more in the relationship even though they showed up less effectively, right? They were there, right? They may not have been very effective in being there. They might have, you know, tried to tell their partner, you know, well, God loves you and I'm trying to, right? You know, I mean, it's a statement of the commitment, but it doesn't have good emotional follow through, right? In another study, religious commitment buffered the negative effects of partner attachment avoidance, but not attachment anxiety. And again, this tells a similar story where more committed partners religiously, um, it softened the effects of the, the tendency to want to avoid emotional experience. And I think that, again, is an example of a partner showing up in a relationship but not showing up emotionally. And the final study looked at religious coping and how it buffered negative effects of avoidance on marital functioning, but only for partners with low attachment anxiety. So, and again, here what we're seeing is, is that partners who have this commitment to God um, often use more effective religious coping. So they might see the struggle that they're going through as a process of growth in their relationship. That didn't change the struggle, but they remain more committed to the relationship as a result of that. I I find these these studies, these these studies interesting because they help illustrate the way in which we rely on God in ways that make us more present to the commitments that we have made. But that doesn't necessarily change how we are in the relationship. Does that make sense to you, right? So our religious commitments and thinking from an integration perspective, uh, the more a couple looks at their relationship as sanctified, like, like God's involved in it or it's important to God, that's a resource that they have. The more that they rely on God as an attachment figure, as someone who can be there in times of trouble and, and times of drif- difficulty, the more committed and more present they are to the relationship, right? So we want to say, you know, through God, their relationship can get stronger, but it doesn't solve the relationship issues. It may make them less, it may make them more tolerable, but it doesn't necessarily solve the challenges that they have together. So when we think about an integrative approach to working with couple conflict, for example, where we're using an attachment perspective, we can see God as the the rock of of salvation, this resource that's available to them. And, you know, like for example, um, you know, having Matt talk about um, God being a co-pilot, right? And what's that like for him? If if we knew, for example, that Matt was, that faith was a part of his story, 
and that he relied on God. And so what does that look like, Matt, right? What happens for you when you start to feel distressed like this and you go to God? What would you, what would you say to God, right? And exploring with, with Matt what that prayer is like, and at the same time, and from an EFT perspective, it wouldn't just be to find out what he said, but what it was like for him as he recounted an experience of God being for, there for him, right? And he might say, well, I feel less afraid. Like, I feel less on my own when I pray because I know that God is with me. And so if I were working with Matt in that way and I'm thinking from an integrative perspective and I'm imagining I'm doing this emotionally focused therapy with them, I might say, so when you imagine, you know, when you're praying like this and you're feeling that God's present with you in this moment, what might he be saying to you about Rhea? What might he be saying to you about your relationship with her, right? And again, I'm not using that as an intervention to to sort of appeal to his moral expectations, but I'm interested in his experience of God as a present figure in his life who understands not only Matt's struggle, but Matt's need. And in that interaction, then I might we don't know, I might hear Matt say, well, you know, I, I hear God saying to me, you know, hang in there, right? This, this is important. This matters. You're, and then I'd say, if I were being the therapist here, I'd say to Matt, so your relationship with Rhea matters in God's eyes. Yes. Well, what happens is you say that to me? You know, as, you, as you, you sort of experience what it's like for you to see God seeing your relationship. Well, I think, I think he's grieved about it. Right? That, that, that this is sad that, that we're at this place. And I might say to him, so can you feel that sadness right now with me? Can you share some of that sadness that you feel as you see your relationship in God's eyes? And he might choke up and he might get tearful as he did. And and then I might say, what might you say to Rhea about this experience of sadness that you're having right now? And he might say, I I would say to her, you know, this is not what I want. And I know this is not what God wants. Right? I want something different for us. Um, I really care about you. Because in his sadness, he can connect to the emotions that are about her, right? It's connecting up and connecting out, right? It's bringing God's presence in a real way into the reality of their relationship. But the work that's being done is not through God to Rhea, but it's with Matt, then to Rhea. Does that, you see that, right? And it's about, it's really about helping people make connections to their own experience so they can use their experience in new ways. And sort of going full circle then, when we think about marriage as a covenant, right? Did God promise to Israel knowing that Israel would, with certitude? Did did God know that Israel, did God make his covenant with Israel under the assumption that Israel would absolutely be able to be that kind of people? Right? Probably, probably not. That's not the nature of the God that we love and serve. The God that we love and serve loves us no matter what. Right? And so it should be no surprise that when couples make commitments to each other in their relationships together and they stand up in front of their friends and their congregations and they promise for better or for worse, richer and poorer, health and sickness, that while they aspire and they hope for health and they they desire well-being and that they hope that's their story, they, they often don't anticipate the negatives, right? 
But that often is the way life is. I mean, we, we are faced with threats. We, are, we live in a broken world. We live in a world that needs redeemed. But that's why we need covenant. Because it, it's, it's the context, right? It's the promise of God that we live out as the promises we make when we seek to love, even though we don't know what we're getting into. And so, just like the still face paradigm illustrates, the question is not, do we have love all the time in romantic relationships, right? We often have enough. It's what do we do when we don't? And what makes a difference in those moments? And where do we find the strength and the grace to repair those relationships? And I've illustrated for you today that Emotionally focused therapy can be one way of approaching that such that the therapist can provide a resource by being present to the distress that's there and help people begin to connect to the emotions underneath that are about the relationship itself. And as that happens, people move toward greater vulnerability, first with the therapist and then with each other, and they find their way. And what I've wanted to suggest to you, somewhat preliminarily, because I don't have a, a taped example that I could show you. I'm conjecturing about what I would do with Matt in this way. But I wanted to show you a way that we can think about God being an attachment figure as I would, I, I don't think we need to use that language theologically, but I think it's practical when we think about the theories that we use to work with people. That actually, we can see the presence of God being a resource for peace in relationships that enable people to do something different in that relationship than they otherwise would. It's not magic. It still requires people to be vulnerable with each other, but I think that's the point. That's what God is calling us to, is toward self-giving love. It's Philippians 2. It's it's God, it's, it's Jesus on the cross giving himself to fulfill the covenant, right? It's God making possible which, uh, healing that wouldn't otherwise have happened, redemption that wouldn't otherwise happen. And that's the journey that he invites us into in our own lives and in the lives of those that we serve. So I would like to stop there and then um, just see if we could have a conversation in uh, the 20 minutes or so remaining. I would love to hear from you thoughts or questions that you have even that have come up in result of some of the material that I presented or the video or this, uh, the discussion. But I'd like to expand this so that we can have some time together and talk. So uh, there are microphones if you don't mind uh, going to a microphone and, and we'll get the conversation going. Yes. Uh, why don't you say, go ahead and tell me your question, and I'll repeat it so that people yeah, can hear. Um, I, I'm really struck with the, the words that you're using uh, for fidelity and certitude. And then, then you just threw in this idea of um, what is certain. Um, and God makes the covenant with us knowing we're going to fail. How, that's, that's absolutely certain. That's a big meta theme. Right. How, do you con how do you communicate that to your clients in such a way that is, I know you're going to break it. I know you're going to fail. Right. Um, right. So, and I have two responses. One is um, going back to the idea of what's your role as the therapist? And how does faith matter to that? And so, one is... Um, I, and I, I think it goes back to what's the nature of a therapeutic alliance. And in my mind, the, most, the, the starting point for a therapeutic alliance is the therapist's presence. How available you are, how you're there, does, you know, do you see your client in your own, in, in your own mind, in your own heart? So, and to me, that is a question of eschatological hope. So, 
Do I? And that's why I said this redeeming relationships, because we're actively involved in the process of God's redemptive work in the world. And if I hold that in my mind when I sit down with somebody, then what I'm expecting and anticipating at some level in ways that I may see or may not see is the possibility of hope being present. And I hold that hope in the face of their suffering. I don't make them be hopeful, right? It's not my job to be a salesman of hope, right? But I stand in a place of hope with them. And experientially, I think that enables me to see things I wouldn't otherwise see. So that's the first thing I would say. The second piece of it is, is that yes, destruction, dysfunction, disappointment, um, heartbreak is normative to the human condition, right? No one's privileged in their most important relationships to avoid heartache. I think we want to believe that's the case and that destiny soulmate uh, uh, idea oftentimes is a, sort of an aspirational view of what a real relationship is that is based in certitude. So if I find my soulmate, all will be good for my soul. When in reality, right, I've just made myself way more vulnerable to hurt than I did if I hadn't made that commitment. So I go back to the idea of, of whether it's looking at our salvation um, or looking at resilience, that rupture and repair is normative. That's, you know, that's the story that we're living. That's, that's the redemptive story of God, is that God meets us in our brokenness and makes something possible because of that, that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And so um, with the couples that, you know, there's a lot of, especially for Christian couples, there's a tremendous amount of shame that, that individuals and couples feel when they're Christians and they're having problems. Because we have often a, a sort of victory theology that if, you, if you're right with Jesus, your world should be right. And actually, the world is not right. I mean, it is in the process of being made right, I believe. And our work in working with people is to, is to struggle together and suffer together in the context of that brokenness. Jesus did that. So we are more like Christ when we're present to people's suffering than we are in trying to deliver them from it, exactly, right? Or prevent them from ever being or ever suffering. So in my mind, then, when I see a couple, one of my antidotes to shame is to seeing them right where they are and not being alarmed at where they are. They may be alarmed, and that's okay. Uh, and, and they may feel morally defeated, right, that they, they can't make this relationship that they believe is God-given and God-ordained, and they have all this biblical freight behind all their beliefs, and it's just crushing them. And I may be the only person that's safe enough in their world for them to tell that story to. So I want to be present to their story and recognize that in that moment, what I have to offer them is hospitality, in Henry Nouwen's phrase, a, a sacred space where they can be known for who they are, where they are. Because then I think that opens the door to really the flip side of their struggle is the importance of that relationship, and I can acknowledge that. And that looks very different than the shame narratives that oftentimes they're walking around with because their belief is not connecting to their heart. And that disconnection itself is spiritually disorganizing. Does that get anywhere close to a question, or responding to your question? It's not really an answer, but... Okay, thank you. Yes? Some of the language um, that you're using kind of connects to what I've learned in spiritual direction. Okay. Of. So I'm just curious if that intersects what you're sharing with us. I mean, a part of the language you use reminds me of that, even mentioning Henry Nowen. Right. So we shouldn't be surprised, right, that uh, the process of spiritual direction has um, some resonance with uh, the kind of work that we're doing in therapy. Um, I think the practices are distinct and separate, 
because the contracts that organize the nature of the relationships are different. So if a couple comes to see me as a therapist, there's a specific expectation about the nature of that relationship. But that's not to say that in the process of therapy, people are not being directed, right? Um, the, the wisdom, um, the uh, spiritual wisdom is not flavoring. Um, but I, I think the intentionality, you know, in my mind, one of the things that separates the two is the intentionality of the person whether it's the director or the therapist, about what they're doing. Um, so it wouldn't be a surprise to me that some of my couples have felt directed in the process, even though I wasn't a spiritual director. Um, but I do think the attitude and the, the process of, I mean, I'm a big proponent in our program is as well, that professional formation begins with spiritual formation. That to be, a, to be this redemptive agent means that you really have to look at who you are, not only as a psychotherapist, if that's your profession, but who you are as a person of God. And what is God growing and doing in you? Because how bold and, and, and how audacious it would be to walk into an office to sit across from two people who are asking you, how do we grow in the midst of this conflict and you not being reflective on your own growth, right? To say as if, well, you know, I've got it together and, and, I, and I'm going to help you because I do, right? If we work from a model of grace, then the issues of direction and formation are always relevant to the work that we're doing. And I might submit from a systemic perspective, it may be perhaps the case that your next appointment on your calendar is appointment for you in a way that you didn't anticipate. In other words, that next client that you see is going to tell you something about yourself in a way that God intended, right? Both for them, but also perhaps for the next couple or the work that God is doing more generally. I mean, I think there's a humility that comes with taking spiritual formation as professional formation that begins to organize how we attend to that process differently. So rather than an integration model that says the best integration that we can have is, is a therapy that is organized around biblical passages, or the best therapy that we can have is a, a model where you know, we use like biblical structures for family life and say, if you just follow the form, you will, it will go well with you. You know, and it, to me, that's a good way to be religious, but not necessarily a good way to be faithful, right? The, because, it, you know, Walter Brueggemann, if you ask, well, well, what's the biblical family? Last time I checked, the biblical family's in trouble. We got polygamy. We got lying. We got cheating. You know, I mean, which family are you going to choose? to say, this is the model. And it doesn't seem to be the scriptures really are working to offer us a picture of, here's an ideal form, go, go, go do this form. Rather, they're speaking to our hearts and what we do when we love those that we have chosen to love and those that we haven't, right? Because we can choose our spouse, we don't necessarily choose our children, so, right? You know, or choose our in-laws, or choose our relatives. You, you know, the, but those are actually the opportunities for us to become the people of God who love with grace in the face of uncertainty, with fidelity. Yeah. Yes, please. Right. Sure, absolutely. So the question is, how do you work with couples where there's differences in, in religious commitment or where one is very faithful and one is, is decidedly unfaithful or decidedly not, or doesn't want anything to do with that? Well, again, I, from this perspective, 
we would organize that in, their, in the cycle of interaction that they have, right? That how religious issues themselves are a source of threat in the relationship, right? So in, instead of taking sides, if you will, right? And see, and I, can, I think I could do that. Like, I think I could sit down with somebody who's saying, you know, my faith in Christ is really important and my partner doesn't, I don't think we can have the kind of relationship God intended because they are not a believer, right? And I would say to them, so tell me what happens to you. You know, like when you're sitting in church and that thought comes across your mind, what's happening inside of you? Well, I get really afraid, right? And so tell me about that, you know, and so we have a conversation and we, I elicit the fear that's associated with that. What's connected to the fear? The longing for a connection with that other person. So can I, can I put the spotlight on the longing rather than how their partner needs to change, right? And then that'll change the conversation. That, that has more promise to change the conversation than I did if I tried to work on, you know, trying to make that other person more religious. The problem is not different than really in some ways of saying, well, I don't like this about my partner. You know, I don't like their job. I don't like their family. I don't like their ethnicity. I don't like whatever, dot, dot, dot. And the dynamic in the relationship is this person's trying to change the other person. Now, I, this is where I am, and you might be at a different place, but I think I'm being faithful if I can help that person love the person they're with. Because I trust that that love is a love that God can use to show himself to the unbelieving partner. I believe I have a better shot at that therapeutically of being able to make and affect that change than I do of trying to, say, use therapy for religious reasons, right? One, that would be unethical, right? But Two, I don't think it would be very defensible theologically. I, 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 don't, I, I see Jesus meeting people where they're at and, and working with them toward love and moving them along that love, which is, again, again, it depends on where you start from. If you look at love as, uh, as a cultural given or if you look at love as a divine blessing, right? And I mean by love, self-giving love. Agape love, if you believe that that is something that God has put into the world and is active and it is our opportunity to connect to that and help people in the relationships that matter most connect to God's divine power through love, then we're going someplace. Yes. Right, right, right. And so, you know, so it depends on the context. If I were meeting with somebody individually around that issue, right, then I, I, would, I, would, I would want to go to their experience of what it's like for them when they feel like they should feel a connection to God and they don't. You know, we're going back to spiritual direction. We actually have a wealth of faithful followers of Christ who have that very feeling, right? I mean, Mother Teresa being a, a recent example of being able to write about, and the Psalms are full of that. God, where are you? I don't feel like you're anywhere near me. And if you look at that as a, the Psalms as a resource for our prayer life, then you say, maybe there's permission to actually feel the dis-ease of not feeling connected to God in a moment and still holding on to the importance of that. See, because that's the other flip side to me, is why it bothers you is because it matters to you, right? And that's what I want to understand, and that's what I want to explore. And I've, if we're thinking that in a couple's context, then I would want to know how that insecurity matters to the relationship, or matters to their experience of the relationship. And I would do a similar thing in relationship to that. But I think that's the, you know, I'm, that's part, I'm going to sort of, I feel like I repeat this point, but I think it's important is that oftentimes we see fear as a problem to solve rather than something to understand, right? It's there for a reason. It's a signal. It's information. 
Emotions are information, right? And oftentimes we, because of our culture, because of our tradition, because of our background, we tend to try to turn those signals off. They just show up in other ways. So that's, I think, part of why I find this approach valuable is because it's given me resources to connect with people at a level that I understand more about who they are and what they want, and I can help facilitate a different kind of relationship because we get clearer about what matters most in their relationship. All right, well, one more question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So hopefully we'll be able to do this every year, in, not with Jim. Well, maybe with Jim, but not with Jim. Uh, <laughs> no, only, it's really, only every yeah, 21 years wait, is enough, you know, right? It is. It's yeah, like yeah, once okay. every 20 years we can get together. Most everybody here knows that. Most everybody here knows that. Um, next year we're hoping to do something on a systemic view of relational intimacy for singleness. Uh, and we're, the whole idea is uh, looking at how do we understand um, intimacy, not just within marriage, but within singleness, and what does that look like for us as clinicians and as a church. So that'll be hopefully next year. So keep your ears open, and thank you very much for coming. If you've got CEUs, check with Chelsea in the back, and go in peace.